Back in the days before the Nintendo Switch released, Nintendo was in a really weird place, like the Wii U wasn't selling all that well, and the 3DS was starting to sell decently, but it had taken a while. So Nintendo was maybe exploring other options and other markets that they could potentially get their games out to and do something a little bit different. So we entered the era of Nintendo on mobile phones, like iOS and Android. This was a wild time. Nintendo had the reputation of being like, you know, a console only thing. They really weren't down to do like crossovers, mobile games or appearances on other consoles too often, but now it's been a few years. The games have evolved. They've changed. Some of them have been abandoned. So what is it like nowadays? How have these games changed and what is the experience like if you jump on a mobile game? Well, it's interesting. I can tell you that much. And I decided to put myself through the gauntlet of playing every single Nintendo mobile game, document my experience, so then you don't have to do this. And so let's jump into this here. Since we talked about Animal Crossing on this channel, maybe we should start with Animal Crossing Pocket Camp. You know, by 2017, Animal Crossing fans were starved for a new Animal Crossing game. Fans have been waiting for like a Wii U announcement for quite some time. That never ended up coming. But then in 2017, we got the announcement of Animal Crossing Pocket Camp, a mobile game that would be a live service free to play game that would then have microtransactions built into the game. Instead of like being the mayor of a town, you were like at a camp. This was allegedly one of the first games Nintendo planned as a part of their like mobile lineup of the first like couple of years of games that they were gonna release. Probably because Animal Crossing did have mass appeal and the game released and it was okay. Honestly, as big of an Animal Crossing fan as I am, I kind of played this one for a couple of days and then just fell off. I lost interest. I felt like there wasn't an incentive of like long commitment just because of the format of the way the game was. But over the years, things have changed dramatically and there's still a core player base here and this game still gets regular updates. So what does that mean? So I opened up the game and was greeted to a lot of updates I had to do and they took a long time to download surprisingly, even though I was kind to Wi-Fi. Nonetheless, once you do load up into the game, you definitely get like a bunch of updates and things that are going on in Animal Crossing Pocket Camp. Actually, I'm a little impressed with how often and how frequently they have different events going on for this game. And I think that that probably really helps a lot of the player interest long-term nowadays. I mean, it's like a list of chores to do or other things to participate in, but hey, it's something to do and you get special unique items. One thing that I'm really jealous about is that Pocket Camp always has a ton of items that that are related to different events where games like Animal Crossing New Horizons doesn't get any updates ever. Okay, so there's like this winter event going on and I had to go like catch some bugs that are on a plant and I just like tapped the screen and uh, it made me do this whole tutorial to teach me how to do this. What's going on here? Where's my Tom Nook debt? What even is this game? I do have to say the amount of like screen clutter is pretty excessive it feels. <laughs> like there's just a lot going on on the screen. There's always these like pop-up slideshows trying to tell you how to do something. I get it, they want the game to be user friendly but it's also maybe a little user overwhelming. Goldie wants to move to my campsite, but only if I have the right furniture. Let's be real, Goldie's always been a bit troublesome. I have to say, I have forgotten how much though Animal Crossing Pocket Camp has successfully managed to at least capture the feeling and experience of Animal Crossing and, you know, present it in this different type of gameplay setting. It is different from a main Animal Crossing game, but so much of the quirk, charm, and character personalities are still there that it does feel like an extension of Animal Crossing. I just struggled to come back to this one because at the end of the day, I'd rather play a mainline Animal Crossing game. Though, I really hope that in the future, Nintendo takes some big notes from Pocket Camp because there are a lot of creative things like the myriad of updates that this game continues to get that would be really great to see translated into, you know, a next mainline game. Even just little things like being able to see your friendship levels and see how your character progresses over time are big bonuses that I'd like to see translated into a main game. Do I see myself playing Pocket Camp long term? I don't know. I feel like I struggle to find my bearings on what my long-term goals are with the game, so I can't find myself wanting to come back and work towards those goals, and a lot of the events are more structured around these short-term goals. You have to play during this time to get this done, and I think that that sounds almost more stressful for a player like me than rather, you know, getting to just go at my own pace, which is kind of what I feel like Animal Crossing is about. But I don't know. I feel like Pocket Camp is good, but maybe it's not as amazing as it could have been or maybe they should take these ideas and make something bigger that's more universal across the board.
I don't know. Okay, so next I wanted to look at Mario Kart Tour, which we'll be playing on the iPhone again. I did briefly play this when it first came out back in 2019, and I remember not being impressed by it, but apparently a lot has changed since then, so I'm optimistic here that things won't be the worst. I jump into the game, and first thing I'm supposed to do is fire off a pipe. What does that mean? Oh, okay, so it's like to get something, and I got Toad. Okay, so from here, the game puts you into a tutorial, so great, we'll learn how to play. Now, Mario Mario Kart Tour is a little different than a regular Mario Kart game. You actually don't press a button for the gas or acceleration. You're just always going, but you can steer. And I had to learn how to steer and driving through these rings. Was surprisingly harder than it looks, maybe. I don't know. I still did it perfectly, but I felt like I almost missed a couple of times. Man, mobile games have really evolved since I was a kid. After I got a hang of it, then they make me learn how to use the power-ups, which you just tap on the screen. Pretty easy to shoot forward or backwards. Then on the second lap, they add all of these racers and they start off going much faster than you but honestly, they didn't stand a chance. My instinctive Mario Kart DS skills kicked in and uh, I beat these AI bots pretty easily. Okay, you know what? This was actually a decent start here. I'm not fully hating this at this point. I got Metal Mario unlocked the next time I fired off the pipe and now we have to download the actual game. Yeah, I didn't realize this was one of those types of games where you download like a little demo of the game and then you have to wait for the actual game to download. It doesn't take too long, but for whatever reason, my iPhone settings have it where if I close out of the game, the download stop so I had to like let it sit for a couple of minutes before it was downloaded but then after that I was good to go I was able to race some more so the next race was on some level in Singapore which was interesting and I'm in 50 cc it looks like it's matchmaking me against real players but I'll be completely honest whenever a game has me like pitted up against other players very early in the game I'm always suspicious that they're not real players I feel like they're bots or something I don't know for sure because these names that are on like the leaderboards look weird I mean they look believable also don't ask why my name is Dolphin Knight it's a whole long story. But uh, this race, surprisingly, was pretty easy. I beat all of these other players. If they were real or not, I don't know. But I beat them at the 50cc level. Also, it's worth noting, on this Mario Kart game, the games are completed in just two laps, which, honestly, I kind of like this almost more. Maybe it's my short attention span, but in general, with a mobile game, I feel like I don't want to sit down and just spend forever having to commit time to play a game, because otherwise I just won't play it. But the fact that there are only two laps makes me feel like I can just, like, pick up the game and play as I please which is really cool. I actually like this probably more than what Mario Kart 8 has nowadays. After that first race, I unlocked a Tokyo level, which is really cool. And um, yeah, this one was fine too. Honestly, these levels aren't like the most aesthetically beautiful Mario Kart maps I've ever seen, but they're definitely not bad either. By the third race, I was pretty confident that at this point I'm playing with bots. There's no way these are real people. How am I getting first place every time? Some things don't add up. Like there's no latency when the game is like loading in and it like, like starts up right after the cutscene whenever I press to skip it rather than like giving time for everyone to watch the cutscene. Nonetheless, I do win this race narrowly avoiding getting blue shelled, which was kind of cool. After that, I had to do a time trial thing, which was really easy. I had a great time. Three stars. Good job, Elijah. And then it opened me up to what I think is the real multiplayer side of the game. Like it was like a little congratulations. I finished a tutorial and then they tried to entice me to buy some things from the store. You know, the good old one too. Nonetheless, from there, I switched over to multiplayer and did a race on that side and yeah, I could tell these were real players at least. There was a little bit of latency before starting and they kind of drove like maniacs. I was racing my heart out trying to prove a point. I do think if anything, I got a little bit better at maybe drifting a bit, but outside of that, my skill level hasn't gone up too much. I didn't do the worst, which would have been seventh place. I did fifth place. So, I mean, it's not the worst. It's also not the top three best. This one was on the Bangkok level, which apparently is one that you play regularly in multiplayer, I guess. And then you have to play more to unlock new locations to play regularly. So after that race, I did a second run on the same level with a slightly different group of people. Some of the people were the same though. And this time around, I still got fifth place. I was trying. I was trying to come up with some new strategies that no one's ever thought of before, but it didn't seem to really work for me. That being said, while I'm probably not the best Mario Kart racer in the world, I was relatively impressed with the game this time around. It's actually a decently fun experience. I can see myself jumping back and playing some online again sometime in the future. I think this one deserves like a nine out of 10. And I think that's pretty Pretty good for a mobile Mario Kart game. It captures the essence of the original Mario Kart games, it does some new stuff, it has some interesting locales that are different, and um, here's to hopefully seeing more intuitive Mario Kart games in the future. You know, Pikmin Bloom is the newest game that technically Nintendo has put out, and this one obviously is heavily inspired by Pokemon Go. It's even developed by the same studio, Niantic, who did Pokemon Go. And you know what? While I haven't recorded my own personal experience playing this game, it is a really interesting concept. They kind of took the 
the Pokemon Go formula, but adjusted it for a completely different play style, where still people who would like Pokemon Go could easily pivot over to Pikmin Bloom, but it's different enough where the experience can be different based on what you prefer. Pikmin seems to be much more like step based focused, where like your total amount of steps you make has the most impact on like your gameplay and what Pikmin you can encounter. Sure, there are some Pikmin you find in more busier places, but it's not like they're divided based on where you are or by the location specifically in the same way that Pokemon Go was. Kind of surprised how this one turned out to not just be a full on clone of Pokemon Go. And obviously I think Nintendo was riding on this one, maybe being like the successor to Pokemon Go, but Pokemon Go back in the day when that came out was like the biggest thing ever. 2016 was a crazy summer. And it's weird to think that I'm like almost nostalgic for a time when Pokemon Go was everything. But yeah, those days were really cool. I don't think Pikmin Bloom in any capacity like compared to Pokemon Go at its height, but for being something a little bit different added to Nintendo's catalog and it being one of their most recent mobile games, it does show that maybe they're focusing more on like mobile experiences versus like the nitty gritty mobile games that we'll talk about more in this video. Okay, then there was this other Pikmin game, Pikmin Finder, which is different from Pikmin Bloom, but it's very similar. It's like you use the AR technology on your phone to have like Pikmin that you go and find. And it really was a game more, I think, to promote the launch of Pikmin 4. But nonetheless, it did release. Um, I don't know what to say about it. You go and you look for Pikmin. It's, it's cool, I guess. Let's go to the next one. Okay, next I wanted to talk about Super Mario Run because this was a wild time. I mean, we had never seen Mario just like appear on something else. So to see a Mario game that actually had decent looking visuals on a mobile phone was kind of crazy, actually. Now, this game seems to be reusing some assets from the new Super Mario Bros. series. But I remember when this game launched thinking it was really weird how the game's free for the first three levels and then you can pay money for it. Tricky, tricky. These microtransactions are going to be in there still again game even if Mario's like on an auto running type thing and we get a platform around that feels and plays like Mario could be really cool. I'm surprised I didn't spend that much time with it back in the day but now I'm excited to give this one a try. So let's see what this one ends up actually looking like. Okay so I was really dissuaded by the fact that this game supposedly only lets you play three levels before you're expected to pay money but we went ahead and gave it a try anyways. Now I have to say there's one of two things going on here maybe both. Firstly my iPhone is uh, a little bit older and I think my my touch response is maybe down or I'm really bad at Mario platforming when he's running specifically out of my control. I do feel like it is a little weird trying to control an auto run Mario game because like he still feels like he's out of control. Like you can't make those midair adjustments that you're used to. And man, I struggled trying to like get a hang of Mario. Now, the first levels aren't necessarily hard, but like I felt like I was just messing up on some really easy jumps and it was almost embarrassing that I felt like I was just really, really bad at the game. After you play the first level though, it does give you this like toad rally game where you're supposed to compete against another player. I don't think it's in real time. I think it's like a ghost race against another recorded player. And then it tells you who won and who did better. And I'm apparently awesome at this one, even though I didn't think I did good at all, but I won. Now, interestingly, there are ways to get more levels. Like for instance, I unlocked a new level that's only available for a couple of hours uh, by playing a level or something. But I thought it was interesting. I gave it a try and um, I don't know what I'm doing here. I couldn't figure out how to get this door unlocked at the end. So I don't know, maybe this one's too advanced for me. I gotta work my way up to solving these types of puzzles. Don't worry, I'm equally as disappointed in myself and my playing ability here as y'all are probably watching this, but I did manage to get through those first three levels and <laughs> the third level uh, took me maybe a couple of tries, but I was starting to get a hang of it and it was starting to maybe get a little bit fun and yeah, paywall right after you beat the third level. So the one thing I didn't realize though is it doesn't immediately expect you to spend money to unlock the entire game. You have a lot of options that you can go through to unlock the next level. You can either go collect the purple coins, and I did the math. I did have quite a few purple coins left in previous levels, enough to unlock this level, and if I wanted to get a head start on another level. I could have collected more toads playing the little multiplayer mode, or I could have just spent money outright. So it's not like a requirement that you have to spend money to move on, which is the impression I was under. So that was at least a little bit of a positive thing. All in all, you get like 40 minutes of gameplay if you're trying to learn the ropes like I did before you get to the end, but I'm kind of optimistic 
about the future, I feel like the game is going to get a little bit better. I still wish I had full control over Mario, but I think I'm going to come back to this one and still give it a try despite how bad I am. I feel like I just need to get better, and uh, the only way I can do that is play the game more. Miitomo was a really interesting time for Nintendo when they launched this app out of the blue. This one you can't actually use anymore, so it's kind of interesting that this thing existed, but essentially it was kind of like a social media platform or some integrated Nintendo community that was like not simplistic enough as like a normal social media network would be, but like stylized in its own charming way, if that makes sense. Like everything is just kind of based around these Mii's and the community of Mii's and sometimes there's like polls that you can participate in or you can read different posts and other things that the community is posting, which is kind of cool. And I like the whole aspect of the me being at the forefront of it, but overall, a lot of the things that this app featured seem to just kind of be like a, why does this exist type experience? It's like, yeah, you can participate in many different things with the community, but like, what's the incentive? What's the point? You get to see a me maybe make a joke here or something. It's funny for a while, and there were some quality memes back in the day, and unfortunately, I didn't get to participate too much on me Tomo, but I do think it was an interesting relic. And I almost wonder, like, if this thing didn't get discontinued as it did, like, five years ago, what it would have looked like today. Like, imagine Nintendo just continued to support Miitomo as, like, the most crucial thing about Nintendo. Like, it was their number one pride and joy. I wonder what type of social media website it would have looked like. I wonder how different things over the years could have been, and if this would have been integrated on other things, like the Switch. I just know, like, third-party Animal Crossing websites went crazy when Animal Crossing came out, and I can't help but to wonder what Miitomo would have looked like during the Animal Crossing New Horizons era. Okay, when it comes to Fire Emblem, it's kind of a series that you either really love or you know that one guy who really, really loves Fire Emblem. Like, he really loves it. Now we move on to Fire Emblem Heroes, and I'll be honest, I have barely any knowledge of what's going on in the Fire Emblem series. Like, I mean, I know that they're like a tactical RPG game, and I've seen gameplay of them, and I've tried playing a little bit of Fire Emblem Heroes once in the past and had no idea what I was doing, and I have a short attention span, so I probably fell off quickly, so I'm excited to kind of force myself to sit down and see what's going on here. Now, it is worth noting, Fire Emblem Heroes is actually the highest grossing Nintendo mobile game, so this is like the biggest W that Nintendo has for all of their mobile projects, grossing over $656 million worldwide, which is absolutely insane. And that's just as of 2020. That's not including, like, the last four years. Now, apparently some of the goals for this game were to correctly create a Fire Emblem experience that worked on mobile, so it was intended to be a Fire Emblem game first, and then, like, those elements of mobile or whatever would be implemented later. And I think that this might have been one of the reasons why this game ended up being so successful. It wasn't, like, a watered-down version, necessarily, of the core gameplay like we saw with Animal Crossing or we saw with Super Mario Run. This game at least had some level of ambition here. Okay, so when it comes to Fire Emblem, usually each game has a set of characters and they're usually each unique to their specific games. But in Fire Emblem Heroes, it has like a ton of characters from all the games that are tied to like a gotcha unlock system. What's cool is all the characters have like their original art and voice actor and there's like special event variations of characters like you just get like a Christmas outfit random for them. Now, this game does have its own story, and it has unique main characters that are just from Fire Emblem Heroes, which is actually pretty okay. Now, compared to the actual gameplay of, like, a Fire Emblem game, the combat is kind of like a chessboard, and you have units that you can move a set number of spaces, and then depending on whether you are in range or close combat, you have to move, like, close enough for the relative battle to begin. It kind of combines this, like, strategy element into it. Then, of course, like, other games like this, there's different types that have better advantages against other things. And you know what? From what I can tell, while this might not be my favorite choice for like a mobile game, it's actually kind of decent and gets a lot of support and updates, which is really nice for a game that's been out for a few years now. You do even get a generous amount of currency where you can pull some characters for free, which is kind of nice, at least from the impressions I can have from playing this just for a little while. Sure, this isn't like the full-blown Fire Emblem experience like a mainline game would have. There's still stuff missing that would be in a normal Fire Emblem game, like romance options or other little things. I mean, at the very least, romancing options did kind of play a bigger role into the other games, but honestly, this game, for what it is, not that bad, surprisingly. Nintendo also messed around with this big mobile app for a while. Like, when Splatoon 2 came out, they're like, listen, y'all are gonna love this. If you want to talk to your friends, you have to use your phone. And, like, there's an app, and you can, like, plug in a headset to it that also will connect to the TV sounds. <laughs> it was a mess. It literally is the dumbest thing that they don't have like just 
regular communication functionality built into the Nintendo Switch. I mean, Discord would have been fine enough, and Xbox and PlayStation have Discord now. But man, Nintendo Switch's little communication thing was weird. They tried to integrate it for Animal Crossing even, thinking people would use that voice communication feature. No one ended up using it. It's just a lot of extra steps for features that aren't too integral to the game, and it just becomes more tedious. Like, Fortnite just has a built-in voice communication system, and that works fine. Why couldn't they just do that for their games like Splatoon and Animal Crossing? I mean, this technically is an app, though, so we had to acknowledge it to some degree, but yeah, that's... That's what it is. One of the most puzzling games to release was the Dr. Mario World game. A lot of people don't even remember this one existed, but from July of 2019 till November of 2021, two years and three months, this game existed and was kind of like a, I don't know, how do you explain it? A Dr. Mario game that kind of has a lot of the same monetization features that you would see in a game like Candy Crush. You can play this game single player or there was like this versus a multiplayer mode. And unfortunately, as much as I wanted to play this one for this video, I can't. The game was shut down and there's no way of like reviving a dead version of the game or I don't think that there's any like fan projects that was able to preserve the gameplay itself it needed to be connected to the servers as far as I'm aware so they at least did announce that Dr. Mario World would be shutting down a few months before it actually did shut down and the game was rendered completely unplayable which is a shame because apparently the game still made a revenue of about a hundred thousand dollars in like people spending money on the game whether to unlock things or purchase diamonds as the in-game currency so the people who didn't spend down their things or who had spent their stuff down and unlocked cool things are uh, kind of out of luck. The game shut down and their purchases evaporated. Never really a fan of uh, games that end up doing that. It's weird. But not only back during this time was Nintendo, you know, putting out some classic characters onto mobile devices for the first time, but we had brand new IPs that were never before seen that were coming straight to mobile phones. So the next big Nintendo thing was bam, right there on your iPhone if you wanted in the form of Dragalia, lost. Now this one's interesting because we can't go back and replay it and see what it's like nowadays because the game uh, shut down in February 2022. But I did play this one a little bit because I was curious what it would be like. Now I wasn't there day one but I did come later and it was a little bit overwhelming. There was a lot of stuff going on and it was kind of hard to keep up with like what I was supposed to be doing at first but I eventually did get a feel for it. But the long story short of the game is that the gameplay was like this real-time action combat system and you got to control a team of characters and they all had their own abilities. You had to like tap and swipe on the screen to perform basic attacks and like dodge enemy attacks and whatnot. But part of the game also was building out your team and you had to have different elements represented so that like when you go up against enemies you have like the right abilities to not like be weak against everything. But the big twist in this game was that you got to turn into a dragon. Kind of like Persona where you use your Persona. Now the big thing about this game though was just like a lot of other games released during this time it was a gotcha game which essentially means that if you want to acquire new characters, dragons, or equipment, you could use the in-game currency or real money if you want to and summon characters and dragons. But of course, like the really good ones are rarer, so the chances of getting them are harder, so you need to try more often and spend more money or in-game currency to get the characters. It wasn't like unbelievably atrocious or like really offensively harsh with how hard it was to get some of the characters, but still, obviously they had to make money some way and this game was free to play, so that's where they made their money. I do have to say, while I don't remember all of the details of the story, I remember thinking that it did have a decent enough story early on to kind of get me into the game. I liked the fact that there was a lore in a universe. There was like something there to explore if I wanted to more so than like just a game that just throws you in with no context as to what's going on. Though, sometimes with a mobile game, you don't really want to have to think about the lore in the universe. So this could be like a give or take depending on what side you feel like you're on when it comes to these types of games. Sometimes you just want to play the game and you get like a bunch of story and dialogue then I guess you can skip, but then you're lost later on if you do decide to get invested in the story. I don't know. This seems like a personal problem, not really a Dragalia problem. There was also a co-op and multiplayer mode in this game, but um, I didn't have friends who had this game, so that was never used by me. And then over time, there were events and updates, limited time events where you can only get like certain characters. They really did try to keep this game going as long as possible with like the live service model and doing regular updates. But I think the writing was already on the wall after a couple of years of this game being out, and I think when they 
announced that they were going to start slowing down the development of seasons and start doing more meaningful updates at a slower pace. Kind of marked the beginning of the end. And then ultimately the game was discontinued in February of 2022. And I think a lot of people who did like Dragalia Lost, like still have fond memories of this game. I just don't think that many players stuck around long term. And maybe there just wasn't enough content or maybe the gameplay loop wasn't really built as something that people were intended to play forever and ever and keep coming back to and just doesn't work as a live service format. I would love to see Dragalia Lost brought back again, but maybe as like a standalone release on an actual like Switch console that just has a beginning, middle, and end, and then that's it, rather than them trying to kind of extend it out. But I mean, it looked okay. Visually, it kind of looked like a 3DS game or an early 3DS game, and like mobile games nowadays look really, really good. So I don't know. Dragalia Lost was just an interesting game. I don't necessarily think it needs to come back desperately, but I would like to see the IP revisited maybe in the future. So I can't really give this one a rating because you can't play it nowadays. So I guess it's a zero out of 10 because you can't play it. Rest in peace. Now, early in this video, we talked a little bit about Pikmin Bloom and Pokemon Go obviously is one of the biggest things that comes up when you look at like Nintendo catalogs of games on mobile devices. But Pokemon Go to an extent is almost this whole other entity beyond what Nintendo has tried to do with their first party games. So I'm almost wondering if maybe we should talk more about Pokemon Go in its own Pokemon related mobile mobile game video because there are so many Pokemon games that have released over the years onto mobile devices. I mean, there is Pokemon Go, Pokemon Unite, Pokemon Masters EX, Pokemon TCG Live, what a disaster that is, Pokemon Cafe Remix, Pokemon Quest, Pokemon Shuffle Mobile, Pokemon Home, Pokemon Magic Carp Jump, Pokemon Sleep, and that's literally just the tip of the iceberg here. It goes way, way more in depth. And obviously Nintendo has a stake in the Pokemon company, they own equity in it, but it's not necessarily like their individual planning. It's kind of like delegated to like the Pokemon company, but still incredibly interesting. And I'm just really wondering if maybe we need to just dive deeper in than try to like cram these all into like a specific Pokemon section for this video. I don't know. Let me know if you feel like it was dumb for me to split them up into separate videos. I'm still debating if I should do that topic. Maybe if this one does well, we'll follow it up and look at all those Pokemon games later. Okay, to be fair, there are a couple other mobile apps Nintendo has released. Like they did a parental control app for controlling your kids' Nintendo Switches. I guess that's kind of cool. A neat parenting trick. The real takeaway is that they did these CGI cutscenes to like showcase how the parental control thing works and that I think is cool. Also, only available in China is an application called WeChat. And no, it's not like the Nintendo Wii chat. It is the famous Chinese application WeChat. Nintendo developed it alongside Tencent for their Nintendo Switch release over there. Kind of interesting. It's not really a Nintendo app, but I thought it was worth mentioning at the very least. But man, there are so many opportunities Nintendo is still sleeping on with bringing their IPs to mobile. Sure, I understand now if they want to kind of pivot away from the gaming side of things because they have, you know, their big games on Nintendo Switch, but there's other uses of applications I'm sure people could sign up for. I don't know, maybe it's time to bring the DS Picto Chat back. Do you guys remember that application? I don't know if anyone actually remembers it. They could do things like games and bring WarioWare, I feel like. WarioWare's had a couple of games recently now, and I feel like a WarioWare game on a mobile device would just be perfect, like those short micro games you could just jump in and jump out. Easy money, Nintendo, what are you doing? Now, we recently did a video on like game series Nintendo won't revive, so you can always watch that after this, but Nintendogs would have been such a genius shoo-in for a mobile game versus like a game you have to go buy like for $60 and then have a Switch also. I think there's a reason like interest in Nintendogs died off when a lot of us grew up and maybe if they brought it back in like a mobile free to play or freemium type experience, they could do better. I mean, sure, there's a ton of virtual pet games out there, but Nintendogs, that's like some brand recognition stuff. I don't know. That's just an idea. I think it's cool. Nonetheless, if you enjoyed this video, make sure you subscribe with notifications on. Thanks so much for watching. We'll see you guys next time, maybe with another video.